You're listening to the Speaking Tongues podcast. I'm your host, El Sharice. Each week, I sit down to a conversation with multilinguals where we discuss and celebrate language, life, and culture through our own perspectives. Episode 60, Speaking Irish. Hello, language lovers. Thank you for joining me for this episode of Speaking Tongues, the podcast and conversation with multilinguals. Today, I have the pleasure of speaking with John, who has come to join me today to discuss the Irish language. In this episode, we talk about Irish as it's seen and spoken in Northern Ireland, where John is from. He tells us about some differences between how the language is used there versus in the Republic of Ireland. We talk about Hiberno-English and how there are some surprising connections between English spoken in Ireland and English spoken in the United States. John walks us through some particular qualities of the Irish language, and we talk about how the language itself has become more visible in recent years. In a brief diversion, John tells us how he's been taking steps to learn Manx, And we even have a quick comparison lesson on some words and phrases in these Celtic languages. And of course, we could not go an episode talking about Ireland without discussing the culture and some of the big myths and misconceptions held around the world about Northern Ireland and the Republic of Ireland. Big thank you to John for this thoughtful conversation and for sharing your journey with us. If you enjoy this episode, don't forget to subscribe, rate, and review the Speaking Tongues podcast on Apple Podcasts or like and subscribe on YouTube so that other language lovers like ourselves can find the show. And if you've been a longtime listener of the show or even a recent listener, you can now support the show on buymeacoffee.com. Links to all platforms are in the show notes. Okay, let's chat. Welcome back to another episode of Speaking Tongues. I am here with John. How are you today, John? I am great, thank you. How are you? I'm so excited to talk to you. And um, just to let my audience know, this is our second attempt (laughs) at recording. And we had some technical issues the first time. So I'm thank you, um, John, also for making the time to re-record this episode and to talk about your languages. I like like to start each episode with the same question, and that is what is your first language and how many languages do you speak? So my first language is English um, and the languages I speak obviously to varying degrees, I would say most, the languages I would probably feel most comfortable with would be French, Swedish and Hebrew and I have a basic uh, conversational, if you can call it that, ability in Irish, um, Manx, and I've started learning Hungarian, although I wouldn't even say I could have a conversation in Hungarian just yet. <laughs> you have a lot, you have a lot of, of different languages and none of them are really, mm. well, a few of them are related, but a lot of them aren't. Um, oh yeah, if you had asked me like five years ago what languages you were learning, I, it would be a completely different list. And then a couple of years before that, it would be a completely different list as well. <laughs> like, there's no connection for me, really. How does that? How does that happen for you? Like, what? How do you decide, or do you decide, or do the languages call you? Like, how do you decide what you want to study? What draws you to them? I think it's. I'm the type of person that if I come across a language, I'd be like, "Ooh, I want to learn that." Um, well, I feel like so as I mentioned. Swedish, Hebrew, and French would be my best languages, mainly because the so French I did in school, and I did that right up to A level, and I loved it. I still do love French. I don't get to use it as much, but I do love it. And it's just something that's kind of always stuck with me. And by the time I stopped studying it, like actively in school, I had a pretty good foundation that I felt like, you know, I could go off on my own. Um, and with Hebrew, I had to study it part of my course I had to study Hebrew but I fell in love with it and I just I just kept going with it and Swedish was one that definitely called out to me because I was living in Sweden um when I was studying Hebrew oh, okay and being surrounded by Swedish was like it wasn't a language that was ever on my radar I mean <laughs> I never ever ever thought I would learn Swedish it just it wasn't something and living in Sweden it's like oh Swedish is quite cool. Like Swedish is really is 
I think it's because I didn't really know anything about it. Yeah. Um, I was like, oh, wow, this is, this is a great language. And I lived with British people. And so I got to practice. And I feel like living in Sweden was a real benefit because I find the pronunciation of Swedish can be quite, it was definitely different to how I thought it was um, right. when I first started. Mm-hmm. And living in Sweden really gave me sort of that confidence because I could actually imagine native speakers saying words and familiarizing myself with constructs. And I thought, oh, this is great. Um, the other languages like Irish and Manx, Manx was an accident. I just came across it one day and <laughs> I was like, oh, wow, Manx feel like is so cool. And it was from, it's similar to Irish, which I've been on and off learning and had in my life for about 10 years now. And it's just, yeah, this language, it's either I sort of run into a language, like, or it just, I don't know. It, yeah, I just, I just love language. <laughs> <laughs> I think a lot of people listening can relate uh, yeah. to, <laughs> to this journey. Um, so I should say for, cause I didn't say this before, but you are in Northern Ireland. So yeah. mm-hmm. um, when you were growing up in your community, what languages did you hear spoken? Just English. Just English. Okay. Just, just English. Um, so I grew up in the nineties in Northern Ireland. And it was very, uh, very monocultural, very it, Northern Ireland compared to the rest of the UK was very behind on multiculturalism and immigration. So, you know, it, there were some areas in that. So I didn't live in Belfast. Um, I didn't live in the capital. And I didn't live in other places that might have more multicultural um, communities. For me, it was it was just English. Okay. Um, as far as Irish goes, did you see Irish names maybe in or Irish words, vocabulary, etc., maybe in the names of places or mm-hmm. um, people's names or traditions mm-hmm. and things like that? Yeah. So whenever I I didn't, wasn't really introduced to Irish until I was about 17, 18. So I know that to some people, like, oh, you live in Ireland. Um, You didn't encounter Irish until you were 18. I mean, I knew it existed. Um, My first exposure to Irish would really have been on TV. So in Northern Ireland, we get the TV channels for the Republic of Ireland. And there's a Irish language TV show called, well, channel called uh, TG Scatter and it's all in Irish you can watch Spongebob in Irish um, I've watched Harry Potter in Irish um, and on uh, UK TV as well we would have predominantly I think we like music shows like traditional Irish music that was done through the medium of Irish um, there was a couple of you know TV shows that were based in uh, Belfast, for example, that were done in Irish. And that was my first real exposure to the Irish language. And then as I sort of spent more time in Belfast, you would see some bilingual signs in mm-hmm. some areas that would be in English, and then you have the Irish below it. Um, I've met more people with Irish names. Um, yeah, it, it was definitely like a delayed process because obviously in Northern Ireland, the Irish language isn't, it comes with a lot of baggage. It can be, a lot of people have different relationships with it. Some people would, it didn't, it just wasn't present in the community that I grew up in. And yeah, it took me a long time to sort of, oh, Irish, Irish exists. Irish is a really cool language. And yeah, it's, it's just been something that's been on and off me for a lot of years. And only sort of the past year, I've got really serious with like, oh, I want to use Irish because I could. I want to learn all these languages across the world, and there's a language I can use in my doorstep. Mm-hmm. And I think sometimes that doesn't register to me, or <laughs> because I had a friend. So I have a couple of American friends who study Celtic studies and a variety of English or Scottish Gaelic. And when they've come to Belfast, I've taken them to um, 
the on Culture Land, the, the well talked area in Belfast, where you can go to an Irish language cafe, you can go to an Irish language bookstore, and it's just hearing Irish is like, oh, that's kind of cool. There's this little pocket of Irish that's just like not too far from me. Yeah, that's so cool. That's really, yeah. that's really, really interesting. And I, I think that for me, like, I admit, like, I never really thought that Irish was, this is going to sound so bad. I never really thought that, like, because I knew that I- Ireland and, you know, Northern Ireland, they speak English. Um, mm-hmm. And I guess there was part of my brain that thought, like, Irish was, like, not used at all like it was like like in the way that old English is kind of like mm-hmm. oh it's old and mm-hmm. you know Beowulf and blah 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 mm-hmm. so um when I realized that you know modern day people still speak Irish and still mm-hmm. you know are pushing this language forward and and um you know pushing it forward with the culture too I yeah. just I just think that's amazing yeah, absolutely. So in the Republic of Ireland, um, it's compulsory to study Irish. Hmm. Um, throughout junior school, I think I think up to the age of sixteen. I'm not hundred percent sure. Um, but everyone in the Republic of Ireland studies Irish. You also have the option of going to Irish language medium schools, so you can have your general education through Irish. You can do the same in Belfast. There is a um, Irish language school um, as well. Um, and there are little pockets of the Irish language. It's very much alive. It is a misconception that Irish is either a dying or dead language. Um, I never really judge anyone for that view because there are people who live in this island who have the same view. <laughs> um, I, I, and it is a shame, but there are definitely a lot of um, you know, projects that go on to try and bring the language uh, to the forefront of people's minds. Mm-hmm. Um, I do like think it's interesting, you know, as I said, like I wasn't really interested in Irish until I was like 17, but if I had gone maybe 30, 40 minutes down the motorway, I would find people speaking Irish with their first language. And so there's a supermarket around the corner from me that actually it's a Sainsbury's, which is a it's a British chain. A supermarket and you can actually get bilingual signs um which i think is really cool that's but i've never seen anything <laughs> i've never seen anything like that and stuff i was like that thing um but no irish is very is very much a living language yeah. um it is the official language of the republic of ireland most i think there's definitely up and coming more people who speak irish to varying degrees but in the republic of ireland because of the education systems and the role of Irish culture and communities and stuff, I think it's quite it's quite difficult for me to comment on. Mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. But yeah, I think even in even in the north where I live, Irish is very much there. There's a future for it. There's a lot of political elements to it where political parties are resistant to granting political status to the Irish language, mm-hmm. um, even at you know a civilian level people are a bit uncomfortable with it um and yeah it can be quite complicated do you know very much alive yeah do you notice it as and you know I don't want to wade into uh politics only because Mm. I'm an American and I know to keep my business out of (laughs) (laughs) other people's affairs but just um on a I guess on an observational level personally um do you do you notice that um, this acceptance of using Irish in Northern Ireland is changing um, and, and more people are adopting that? Or is it just something that you, you, you are becoming more aware of? I think it's something I'm personally becoming more aware of. Okay. Um, because I, I've never really been involved in sort of I think living away, because I lived away from Northern Ireland for like four years when I was from age 18, and I sometimes sort of live in my own little bubble here. It's like, yeah, I love Irish, but I'm not from a community that would be traditionally associated with an Irish speaker or an Irish learner. Um, 
and I feel like things are changing, hopefully. Um, I think it would be really interesting to start introducing Irish as an option into traditionally non-Irish language areas. Um, I know a couple of friends of mine who went to predominantly Catholic schools and the Irish language was taught there. I went to what would be defined sort of as a Protestant school kind of area and we would not be taught Irish. A lot of people would not want to learn Irish. Mm. Um, but I think there's an opportunity there to sort of say that the Irish language cannot be defined by someone's religion or community background. Like yeah. we have a shit, like it is a heritage language. And I myself have sort of grappled with that concept of is Irish my heritage language? Because my ancestors probably wouldn't have spoke Irish. Mm. Um, maybe like way, way, like a couple hundred years ago. Yeah. But, you know, um, there's no sense of Irish is our language in my family. Um, but I do think it is a heritage language of where I live. Mm. And it has like very important cultural roots. And I think it honestly should be shared with everyone yeah. there's a lot of really interesting sort of academic work on uh protestant speakers of the irish language um i know there's a couple there's been a documentary as well about um protestant speakers from east Belfast, which is a predominantly protestant area um going and learning irish and i think i think it's one of the great ways to sort of bring northern ireland a little bit forward mm -hmm. is that we have we have bridges and I think I think the language could be an excellent medium for that yeah it always is I think language is a oh yeah a great bridge builder between oh definitely people let me take a step back um you and and I thought of this because you're saying that um in the Republic of Ireland it's compulsory to learn the Irish language. So when you were in school in Northern Ireland, you said you studied French in school up to the A level. What language options were there? So you studied French. Were there any other languages that were offered? No. No, no, no. <laughs> no. Um, yeah, when I went to school, so um, primary school from the age of, four or five till 11. Um, we, I was only ever informally taught French by, so one of my teachers, she had actually qualified as a French teacher and then went into primary education. So she taught us in French and that's what introduced me to this language. And then when I went to secondary school when I was 11, my school only offered French. And that was the only language you could study. Um, a couple of other schools in my in my area where I live, one only taught German. What? Another one, yeah, <laughs> it's yeah that really fascinated me because it is usually usually the only languages you will study in Northern Ireland. Certain uh, foreign languages would be French, German, or Spanish, and German would probably be the least one. And then there are other schools that teach Irish. But it's very common to meet someone and they'll definitely have studied either French, German, or Spanish. My school only taught French, another school only taught German, another school only taught Spanish, and another school again only taught French. So I went, I don't know what the equivalence would be for a state school. I don't okay. know if it was a state school, so it wasn't private or anything. Um, and that was the one language we taught. It also wasn't compulsory after three years okay so when you got to about 14 you choose to carry it on for what we call the GCSE mm -hmm. or you just leave it and in my year only seven people studied French for GCSE wow my class was my class was very small and <laughs> I yeah and I actually moved to school when I was 16 and I went to a grammar school, which is, I don't really know how the, I don't really know how the school system works in America, but it's, it's not a state school, but it's not really a private school. It's kind of, it's kind of in between. Mm -hmm. So, cause in Northern, in 
you can't, actually, I don't know if you do it anymore, but I don't know like, what, like, I'm 28 now, when I was 11, I did, I did, I did an exam, uh, it's called the 11 plus, and that determined what kind of school you should go to okay. whenever you were 11, and if you passed the 11 plus, you got to go with this kind of school, I failed, but I went to sixth form, and that school was different, where you had to study French, um, first, second, and third year, but you had in first year you had to do a semester of Spanish and German, and then decide if you wanted to do French and Spanish or French and German for I the see. next two years. Uh-huh. Um, so, and it was compulsory to do at least one language for GCSE there. That's why I moved because I wanted to do French for pre-university exams, the A level exams, and this was the only place I could go. Um, to study French so that's that's why I ended up doing it for A level but yeah my language options were not there weren't many <laughs> there wow. were not many. wow yeah yeah I'm always curious to know what other people are offered in school because here Spanish was our main offering mm-hmm. um, for the most part and then in high school depending on where you went you had different options um, my high school offered French italian spanish oh and cool i took latin in high school oh wow i know so lucky <laughs> i would love honestly like latin is one of those languages but like i would have loved to have done it was a really great foundation for mm-hmm. my language life i think it gave me a really oh. big appreciation for even for english because i'm gonna get off on a tangent but <laughs> no it's fine go ahead go ahead <laughs> um when I was in school, we didn't really learn English grammar that wasn't taught to us. Mm. Like we were taught how to read, um, but we didn't really learn things like um, direct object, indirect object, that kind of good stuff that you really yeah. need to know when you're trying to figure out pronouns in French, you know, like, and if, Ooh, you, yeah. if you don't know those things and you don't know, well, what the hell is an indirect object, then you're like I have no idea either right so um Latin really helped me to understand so I I feel like I learned the grammar of my native language through a second yeah. language yeah that totally makes sense that totally makes sense I think so I said I, I started learning Hungarian and Hungarian was the first language I ever approached that had cases so friends of mine had done German and they were talking about all these cases, the, the dative, accusative. And I right. went, I have, no, I have no idea what they are. And <laughs> even like, I had no idea. And like, Hebrew doesn't have cases. Mm-hmm. Um, if Swedish does, I don't actually know. Maybe I'm speaking grammatically incorrect Swedish, I don't know. <laughs> um, and then I started learning Hungarian. And Hungarian has, I think it's something like, is it like 12 or 14 cases? There's lots of cases and yeah. it really opened. I was like, because when it comes to language learning, I'm not a big grammar nerd. Mm. I, I, I appreciate grammar and I do study grammar, but I'm more, oh, I want to get speaking as soon as possible. Right. And I want to read and I want to listen. I'm not, I don't like studying verb tables. Even when I did French, I the subject. I hated studying verb tables. Um, I'm doing that with Hungarian and I'm like my goodness there are all these cases and it's just <laughs> and then it really it really does make you appreciate how your own language works yeah and it's like oh wow <laughs> uh. <laughs> but I love it I love it I love it yeah cases are I think I took Latin for maybe two and a half years before I realized mm. oh that's what the genitive means. That's what the mm. dative is for. It just, it mm. didn't, I know it sounds so stupid, but it didn't click, you know? Yeah, but it, yeah, it does. It happens, it happens, yeah. yeah. And it only was until last year I started uh, puttering around with German when I started mm-hmm. realizing, oh, now I get, and this is, I mean, I took Latin was 20 years ago. So I'm like, why did this connect <laughs> when I needed? I mean, I still, I did great in the class, but yeah. Um, yeah. So, uh, 
that's my tangent anyway anyway (laughs) um so i want to ask you about irish um and before i continue i want to make sure are we calling it irish or are we calling it irish gaelic so that's an interesting question because it does trip a lot of people up um the general consensus is if you say irish you're referring to irish gaelic so i am gaelic is obviously Gaelic can mean Irish, it can mean Manx, it can mean Scottish Gaelic. So when we say Irish, we do usually just, it means Irish Gaelic. Um, If you say Gaelic, some people might automatically assume you're talking about Scottish Gaelic. Mm. So that's, and even with Manx, if you say Manx Gaelic, sometimes you don't even have to say the Gaelic. If you say Manx, they know you're talking about the separate language. Um... But yeah, and I think I mentioned this when we did the first recording, is that Irish in Irish is Gaelic, and in Manx, Manx is Gaelic, and Scottish Gaelic is Gaelic, and it just means Gaelic. Oh. So each, la- each, language, each language is different, but the name of the language is still Gaelic, mm-hmm. and it's just a different variation of how you say it. Right, okay. But yeah. Just wanted to make sure that I wasn't saying the wrong word for the entire oh, no, episode. You're saying, no. <laughs> no, you're saying, I mean, if you want to talk about Hiberno English, Irish English, that's a whole other thing because I think I've I commented on one of your um, Instagram posts about why the Irish language impacts the way we speak English. Mm. And sometimes the grammar does. And it's something I never thought about either until someone pointed this out to me that. When we ask someone, have they any money? We would sometimes say, have you any, do you have any money on you? Um, and the on you is like hangover of Irish grammar because when you say I have in Irish, you say, like you say, uh, I have a book, which literally translates as a book is asked me. Oh. Um, so that that apparently that's a hangover we would say have you any money on you the on you part I've, I'm sorry that's my accent but I should say on you because um, we would say you um, on you is an uh, influence of, of Irish you know what's really interesting about that for me as a New Yorker mm. we say that too Do you? And you know that there's a huge Irish influence in Mm -hmm. New York City in the beginning of New York City Mm -hmm. with immigration from the 1800s and Mm. yeah that's something that we would say too like do you have any money on you do you have you know I wonder now I'm after this I'm not going to do it now but (laughs) I'm gonna I gotta research this because yeah I'm, I'm always interested in like how especially in New England in in Boston in mm-hmm. New York, uh, in this area, how our speech patterns have been affected by immigration because mm-hmm. we received so much immigration, you know, when the city was becoming incorporated. And mm-hmm. that's so interesting. I think the thing that interests me is that, so in, I can't speak about the rest of Ireland, but in Northern Ireland, it'd be quite common for us not to say tomorrow, we would say the morrow or more colloquially the Mara. And sometimes when I hear Americans say tomorrow on TV, it sometimes sounds like they're saying I'll see you tomorrow or yeah. I'll see you tomorrow. And I'm like, oh, I wonder I, I, I in my head, in my language brain, I'm like, is that an influence of like is that an influence of yeah. I don't know. I mean it might not be. I mean the on your part for the money might not even be an Irish thing, which is what I just believe. Mm-hmm. And then when I thought about it, it made sense. Yeah. But yeah, I would be interested to know like what impact Irish immigration has had on like the vernacular of of those areas of America. Yeah. I'm I'm gonna put out well, I'm going to ask now in this recording for anyone who knows, please get in contact so we can get to mm, the bottom of this. And maybe yeah. someone out there has expertise about it because it 
To me, it makes sense. To me, it makes perfect yeah. sense why, why that would be. I want to ask you yeah. if you know if the Irish language in Northern Ireland and the Republic of Ireland, um, if it differs. And if it differs, are there great differences or are they minor differences? I think, generally speaking, so whenever there's the, the textbook I use to study Irish, uh, well, they're gone scroll. Um, it does mention dialectal differences. So my understanding is there are different there are different dialects. There, so I, so I come from Northern Ireland, which is in the Irish region of Ulster, and Ulster has its own dialect of Irish. And from what I know of my acquaintance with Irish speakers in the South, in the Republic of Ireland, they don't like Ulster Irish because they think it sounds very strange. Um, mostly with pronunciation and general vocabulary as well. So I think we would say Jay Maritakin in Ulster. And I think in the Republic, they would say maybe Kansatakin, um, those kind of differences. Um, mm -hmm. My understanding is generally speaking, you will be understood regardless of the dialect you speak. You will be understood. Um, I've had no sort of issue um although there's a nurse i work with and she's from Donegal, and that's an ulster and we would sometimes speak a little bit of irish together and we don't really have a lot of difficulty understanding each other um but she grew up speaking irish so there's a lot more localism mm. in how she speaks and sometimes mm -hmm. i'm a bit like oh i'm sorry what was that <laughs> kardasha kardasha <laughs> um but yeah there is differences why Irish be spoken around the island. And I think as well, maybe a lot of older Irish speakers might speak a different kind of Irish. I'm not 100% sure, but I do know there will be dialectal differences. So, right from the north in Ulster and the Munster, um, and if you come like, maybe from the far side, like in Kerry, um, in Kerry, it might be a bit different. Um, I would like, after the pandemic, epidemic, whatever, Hit COVID when COVID's over. Um, I would like to go to different parts of Ireland. Um, I've been to, um, so I've been to the Gwaltok. So a Gwaltok is a language speaking area in the west of Ireland, the Iron Islands, um, which are off in County Galway, and an absolutely beautiful place to go. And in that area, most people would speak Irish as their first language. And I would love now. I feel like a bit more confident in my Irish. I would love to go back, and because when I went there, it was just oh, be a ditch. And I went to hello and um, oh, Gorma, I get like thank you, it was, like let the whole place. Like, yeah, I would love. I would love to be able to go and like actually be able to go to a cafe and order a coffee <gasps> in in Irish. That would be that would be great. Um, so I'm not sure if I would run into any. Oh, what what kind of Irish is this boy who's speaking? Um, <laughs> I don't know. I don't know if I. I mean, to be fair, I have that issue with English as well. Like whenever I go to other places, they're like, "I'm sorry, speaking English," because well, obviously of our accent. Um, so I don't know. I don't know. As you're learning Irish, um, what methods are you using? What steps are you taking to improve um, your Irish language? I'm. Irish orthography can be quite interesting. A lot of letter combinations, um, mm. like B H and M H, and they can they can they can change um, what what they sound like depending on where they are in the word. So as I said, like I or I don't really like going through like verb lists, um, but with Irish I do make an exception. And what I'll do is if I with the textbook and I'll listen to the audio and I'll be reading because in my head with Irish, it can be quite, I can see the word and then in my head, I'm not registering the word to read that way. So I'm making more of an exception. So I'm trying to listen to a lot of audio on YouTube if, um, and hopefully if I can get a transcript or just try and like sometimes I'll try and write down the words. Like if I hear a word that I don't know, I'll even like try and write it out based on my knowledge of the orthography of, of grammar and stuff. Um, and sometimes 
sometimes I'll just, I'll just read the grammar book, like a verb table, which I hate, but I have, <laughs> I have a book of Irish verbs and I'll try to read them. And I think for me, one of my biggest methods is to try and write short little essays. Oh. So I do this with all the languages that I'm studying is that I think it's so easy to sit down and like have a list of maybe 10 words you want to learn. But for me, the best way to actually memorize those words is to put them into sentences. So um, I'll try and use grammar structures and words that I've learned previously and just try. So I tried doing this last November when I was learning Manx. Um, I was trying to write a little short story in Manx. I was just writing maybe like two or three sentences a day, nothing too ambitious, just trying to familiarize myself with those words. And I would highlight them. And then the next day, I'd be like, do I remember that word? So I wouldn't write the English. I would leave it in the Manx. And I would do it in the Irish too. And I would look back the next day and be like, do I remember that word? Mm. And I'd be like, if I don't remember it, I have to learn it again. Okay. And then I would add it to a word bank. Um, but I do love to try and speak a language. I feel like uh, that's the best way for me to really sort of practice is to speak it and I don't have really anyone I can speak Irish with at the moment um, I'm hoping post-covid <laughs> that's a thing I can I, I can make opportunities because I live in Belfast now so there's really nothing stopping me post-covid um, to get involved and actually meet other Irish speakers and actually maybe go along to an Irish class yeah that's something I'd be really interested in doing I think also Twitter is a really good resource Mm-hmm. Um, so a friend of mine studies um, linguistics and looks at Irish on the internet and I do look at hashtags I don't always really engage with a lot of Irish language posts on Twitter but I do, I do try like I'm like, like in the background just like looking um, <laughs> but I do try and read them as well um, just sort of see like slang abbreviation that kind of thing just yeah but most people that I really like to get more involved with Irish speaking on a hopefully daily basis yeah and that's another thing is like I would love to go to the Isle of Man and actually speak my Gaelic with somebody right that would be so (laughs) tell me tell me about Manx how did how did Manx Uh, come into you (laughs) I love Manx I love Manx I I I don't want I I don't know if I should say this but I don't know if I prefer Manx to Irish really i don't know i don't know i just what makes it so close to call i don't know it's just <laughs> something about it it's like i think all language learners can really identify with that there's something about this language i just love but i can't put my finger on it mm-hmm. and for me that's mine um but yeah so mine or mine Gaelic, it's the Gaelic language that is spoken on the Isle of Man, which is an island in the Irish Sea between Ireland and Great Britain. Mm-hmm. And it is it's a small language. There's not a whole lot of native speakers, but it's going through a revitalization. Yeah. So I think, I can't remember the body. I don't know if it was the United Nations declared it a dead language, an extinct language. Oh, I don't know. Maybe UNESCO? or UNESCO maybe that yeah, yeah maybe that's one because so it was the the last native speaker and I'm using bunny quotes because there were other speakers of this language mm-hmm. um he died and then it was declared an extinct language mm-hmm. but there is a mind language still in I, I want to say it's in Douglas which is I think the main city, but it might not be in Douglas. And it's called the Vinsol Welga. And it is revital- uh, revitalizing um, Manx. There's a lot. Learn Manx website for a small minority language, learnmanx.com is one of the most comprehensive language learning websites. That's amazing. I've ever encountered. <laughs> it is fantastic. It has a podcast. It has reading materials across different levels. You can read Alice in Wonderland in Manx Gaelic. I have books in my room written in Manx Gaelic. Um, 
you can, yeah, everything is on this website and has lessons from beginners, intermediate, advanced. I just love it. And yeah, I love writing it as well. It's mm-hmm. something really strange. Like I love writing in Manx. It's <laughs> so cool. And it's quite, it's relatively similar to Irish as well. I mean, it's not identical, but you, if you spoke one, mm-hmm. you could probably understand the other. Okay. I know recently um, there was a baking event on Facebook where one baker was speaking in Manx and one was speaking in Irish. And I didn't get to watch it, um, but I thought like, I, was, I watched a wee bit of it afterwards. And I was like, oh, this is fantastic. This is just my kind of thing. This is my kind of thing. Um, Manx, <gasps> Irish and baking. <laughs> That's what I was going to ask you. How how do you notice the similarities and the differences between the two? And, and if they're like, do you think that somebody, well, you kind of said this, but do you think that somebody who speaks Irish can get by if they went to the Isle of Man and, you know, yeah. encountered Manx speakers? Yeah, there's some, I think you definitely could. So, for example, um, there's some words that are very similar. So in, I could say, Tammy John, I am John, which is Manx. If I want to say I am John in Irish, that'll be Pa Me John. It's like those little similarities. Um, and the proposition, so Ach means boss in Irish and Manx, they're spelled slightly different. Mm-hmm. And again, there's no word for yes or no you would just do the affirmative and the negative. Right. Um, so you could say, faster my, which means uh, good afternoon. Tami John, Tami Como on Belfast Danish. So I'm um, John, uh, I live in Belfast now. Whereas if I was in the Irish, I would say, Tami um, John, August, Tami Mahoney, Mel Firsta Nish. Uh, Anish, Anish is the Irish, not Nish. Um, that's another thing. Sometimes I do get them mixed up. Um, you could you could get by. Um, some of the grammar works kind of similar as well. Once you see how it. So, for example, in Irish, if you wanted to say "are you," you would say "and will to." In Manx, you would say "vel u," but the "v" makes sense when you see the Irish "eh." Oh. Because, BH, because BH is sometimes pronounced as the, um, and it is, it's very subtle, but you do notice it. It's hard to explain, but if, if you, um, but yeah, grammar sometimes works kind of similar. Yeah. Um, another example would be sort of, uh, the proper word I think is lenition and mutation, kind of how Irish consonants sometimes work. So, for example, um, Belfast is Belfasta, and but if you want to say in Belfast in Irish, you would say the Mel Firsta because there's an M added before the B. Um, and in Manx, so morning would be Mora, and if you wanted to say in the morning, you would say the Vora. Mm. So it kind of there's the same kind of changes. Um, in Irish Manx, but I think if you spoke one, you could definitely understand the other. So I feel like whenever I was studying Irish Manx at exactly the same time, I was getting kind of confused because I was like, oh, wait, which, 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 right. which. yeah. <laughs> they seem similar enough that, you know, studying them, studying them at the same time could lead to some confusing study mm-hmm. sessions, I yeah. think. Yeah. Do, do you definitely. know? I don't know if if you don't have an answer for this is fine, and I don't expect you to be familiar with. But with the other Celtic languages, is there any intelligibility there? Yeah. So, Manx, Irish, and Scottish Gaelic would be to the, you would you would maybe understand. So I think in Irish the negative would be nil. Um, in Manx, it's hanel. But I think the hanel is actually closer to the Scottish Gaelic. Mm. Um, 
there are degrees of overlaps because they've all they've all developed from uh, Middle Irish. Right. Um, so there are degrees of mutual intelligibility. The but if you speak a Gaelic language, you're not going to understand Welsh. Mm. Um, Welsh is a Celtic language, mm-hmm. but it's a different branch. Um, so the Gaelic languages or the Boidoic languages are a separate branch, and you would not understand Welsh. You won't understand Cornish. You won't understand Breton. They're completely different. Gotcha. Um, I do not speak any of those languages. I do not even understand any of those languages. Um, I have family who live in Wales, and Wales is similar to, to Irish in the Republic. So my relatives in Wales, they speak Welsh because mm-hmm. they grew up speaking it in school, and a lot of stuff is done through the medium of Welsh, which they get the opportunity to join in on. But you won't know, you won't understand mm-hmm. any, you won't understand any Welsh. And again, if you study Welsh, you won't understand any Irish. Right, right. I was just curious, and and as you're as soon as you said Welsh, I was like, oh yeah, that's so different. Like that's not mm-hmm. <laughs> it's not even close to anything yeah. at all. Um I think it's a beautiful language. Like when I hear it, it's such a beautiful language. Um, I think I wanted to learn it a long time ago. You can do it on Duolingo. Yes. Yes. Um, I know quite a few people are doing it in Duolingo. A and I think it's so cool. like you get yeah, you get people in Irish as well. Like Irish is on Duolingo and Scottish Gaelic is on Duolingo and they're doing immensely well. And I think it's so interesting because I follow obviously a lot of content creators from other general foreign languages. But then I follow a lot of people who don't learn languages like actively. And then I see them post, oh, I'm doing Welsh on Duolingo. I'm like, that's so cool. Like, <laughs> of, like, because usually people will gravitate towards the big ones. Like, oh, I'm going to do French. I'm going to do Spanish. I'm going to do German. And I think that's totally fair enough. Like, that's what you want to study. It's fantastic. But then you'll come across something like, oh, I'm doing Welsh. I'm doing Scottish Gaelic. And I'm like, that's great. Like, that's the, lang- <laughs> like, that's the language that you chose of all the options on Duolingo. Right. You choose a Celtic language. You choose a, you choose a, a Celtic language. I think, especially when they don't live in the country where the language is spoken. Yeah. That, that just, that, it just amazes me. I'm like, that's, I think, one of, it's just, it's really funny, like, whenever you see other people's progress in language learning and how they're getting on, it actually is really inspiring. Yes. And it's like, oh, wow, I, I'm <laughs> so glad you're doing this. And it's really motivating me. Right. To go and go and do my own language studying or just, oh, yeah. I think it's just great. Yeah, I think that's really important because you probably notice this too. I I feel like we never really focus on the people who are actively doing it. We tend to mm-hmm. focus on look at this person who learned four languages. We look at this person who speaks five mm-hmm. languages and not really mm-hmm. saying like what about the people who have been learning the same language for 10 years and they mm-hmm. they have ups and downs and they have mm-hmm. you know setbacks and and triumphs so i think that's um it's really cool to see people who are you know taking that step oh, people yeah. who are doing Definitely. it yeah irish culture is very popular all over the world mm-hmm. for better and for worse i mm-hmm. think in in a lot of ways mm-hmm. um yeah what are some of the things about Irish culture and language and maybe even particularly about Northern Ireland that you would want people to know that they may not be aware of? I remember I was I had to answer this sort of question in my head in general to people about what's more than like. Uh, it's interesting that we're asking this question today because the past weekend I've actually seen uh, riots <laughs> In Belfast, um, there's been a lot of violence in the streets. Um, and so I want to say, you know, internationally, there is this image of Northern Ireland being a relatively volatile and violent place. And you want to say it's not, that we've moved on. And there's ups and downs like everywhere. Um, so I feel like I can't not mention the riots that, that I have to mention that there were riots over the weekend and there was violence and it was it was quite unsettling to watch but the reason I also want to mention that was the response from the community that saw this violence where yes you could say there's still a division 
in Northern Ireland in our community. But the communities came together mm. and there was a response of, no, we've, we've had this. Right. We've done this. Right. This is not what we want. And it was a lot of younger people um, and teenagers that were involved in the violence. And, you know, I saw community centers, like Facebook posts being shared from community centers, urging kids not to go out and join the violence, to stay home. Um, and I think even in that, we can see from the community responses, how people responded in general, is that Northern Ireland is a changing place. And it's changing slowly, but we're changing. We are we're more multicultural, which I think is a fantastic thing. Um, we're catching up. It feels like you know we're catching up with the rest of the world. And yeah. the, we're more open. We're we're more diverse, and it's a place you can come on holiday and not worry about violence. Mm-hmm. Um, my, we do have things here, but you know, Northern Ireland is not defined by its violence. We're defined by our resilience. And we're defined by our laughter, and we're defined by, oh, let's go have a drink in the pub, or well, let's go have a barbecue whenever there's like the little bit of sun out, um, <laughs> kind of thing. Like we're, you know, we have there's a lot of positivity in Northern Ireland. I think we overall are an area that wants change. We want a good future for our children, and it's a beautiful place to come and visit. Um, and we're not defined by violence we're not defined by um division religion and all that mm-hmm. um and you know that and the ireland in not just north ireland but the republic of ireland the isle of ireland in general i know sometimes talking well, when you say ireland like in my head i'm like am i talking about northern ireland am i talking about republic of ireland am i talking about the isle of ireland um the isle of ireland you know it's a beautiful place to stay they're buzzing with arts and culture um well generally speaking um you know, I don't, I don't know if you use this term in America, like busking, like a busker. Buskers like who, are like, people who like sing on the bus, on yeah, the, the yeah, street, yeah. on the subway. And yeah, stuff. yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, we have a lot of buskers. We have a lot of street art. We cool. we have a lot of writers. Um, you know, up and coming. And like on my Instagram, I shared a a couple of anthologies of new Irish writing that represented diverse nature of, of Ireland now, you know, uh, it's not white anymore. Northern Ireland and the and Ireland as a whole Irish society is it's changing, it's diverse. Um and you know there's a project that was going on in Belfast. It's called Black in North Irish. And it was interviewing um, I've seen that. Have you? Yes. Oh I've, that makes me so happy. I was the, so... The other people from my thighs. Yeah, I thought that was that was about like um, like people of African descent in in Northern Ireland, mm. right? Yeah, yeah. I, saw, I saw something about yeah. that. Yeah, it was it was a project. I know actually two people that were involved in it. Um, one girl I used to work with, and another guy I used to work with in this place. And it, it's such a fantastic project that because I think there's still some of this misconception that everyone in Ireland is white. And that if you're Irish, you're white, and that, that's not the case. Like, you can you, you can be you can be anything. Like, mm-hmm. you know, um, and to see this project is like black and white Irish. It's like it just it's great. That, yeah. You know, we're telling the world it's like Ireland is diverse. Irish culture is diverse. Um, and there's lots to see and do here. You know, you can go to a city, then you can go to the countryside, you can go to an area where where you probably won't hear English. Um, there's theaters, there's museums, everything. Like it's just, it's, I honestly think it's such a wonderful island, and I feel like a lot of Irish culture abroad. Um, I, I think I've mentioned before to other people, like on St. Patrick's Day. It's funny seeing St. Patrick's Day celebrations in other parts of the world because they make more of a big deal than we do. <laughs> <laughs> like. I, I've only ever celebrated, I mean, say celebrated, like maybe going to the bar um, to have a drink on St. Patrick's Day, maybe twice in my life. Mm. And I'm 28. And, you know, and in the UK, we can start drinking alcohol from 18. Mm. And I've never done it. But on the topic of alcohol as well, um, you know, there is the stereotype that Irish people love to drink and that we're all big drinkers. 
uh, like nothing to be further from free. We're just mm-hmm. like anywhere else. Yes, right. people like to drink. But we're not defined by drinking. And, you know, you can have just as good a time in Ireland, sober, <laughs> completely, completely sober. You don't have to go to a bar. I think our bars are quite interesting because we have a lot of bars in close proximity to one another that would have live music, for example. Mm, cool. Live, um, yeah, this is something I really took for granted. Um, when I went to England, and I found out that a lot of bars, like I'm talking like a like not just really a singer, but like an actual like, band playing instrument. That's not like a oh you go to like loads of bars and you're going to see that, especially like kind of Irish music. Whereas in Belfast, especially, um, I can't really speak too much else with Northern Ireland because as much as I'm to admit it, I actually haven't been to many places in Northern Ireland. The Republic <laughs> of Ireland, yes, not so much north. <laughs> Um, you never explore like, your own home that's why <laughs> no you don't you don't so ever, people ask me oh where should I go in Northern Ireland and I'm like well um <laughs> the, well, the Titanic Museum <laughs> um, the Giants Causeway I've heard of Brit never been um <laughs> but yeah it's like loads like music and art and everything it's just I think there's definitely a perception of what Ireland what Irish music is in the world. And I think part of this is probably um, reinforced by the Irish diaspora. Mm. And by Irish diaspora, I mean Irish Americans, Irish Canadians, Irish Australians, whose families left Ireland in the 1800s. Mm-hmm. And I've had a conversation with a friend of mine about this in Irish history, where I sometimes, sometimes I feel like 19th century ideas of what Ireland is is preserved mm. in in the consciousness of our around the world. I might be completely wrong. Right. But it's like I sometimes I remember whenever I was in I went to Kansas about five years ago. Um and I was at a conference and someone asked me, Oh well in Ireland what you have don't you have to be a Catholic if you're not a Catholic you're a second class citizen. I'm like, no, that's mm. that, that's not true. And I kind of encountered a lot of these misconceptions, and not just in America, but also when I was in uh, England as well, about these ideas of what Ireland actually is. And I'm, like, I'm sorry, but have you met anyone from Ireland who isn't over a hundred years old? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I feel like everyone should come to Ireland and just and actually see what it's like, and not just do the real kind of touristy stuff that's like catered for people who have very preconceived notions. Mm-hmm. about what Ireland is yeah I feel like if you come to Ireland if you can come to Ireland to take the opportunity if you can to sort of really like maybe meet local people and sort of really understand like Ireland has a lot of problems there's also a lot of good things about Ireland and you know maybe the bar you went to isn't actually the authentic experience kind of thing but then what is authentic to right 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 <laughs> No, I think that's an interesting observation that you make because I think here with um, probably a number of um, immigrant groups that have come here in the 1800s, Irish, Italians, um, maybe even Chinese, um, you have these traditions here that have kind of come from hundreds of years ago and they Mm. persist so then people think that this is the way that things are it's kind of like preserving it in like you Mm. know as a like a specimen and yeah you know it just surprises me how few people actually take the time to to wonder and to go out and look and see well what is ireland like now what is italy like now what is what is it like yeah you know i feel like there's different, when people say Ireland, I always feel like there are different kinds of Ireland. Mm. Like, are you talking about, so are you talking about Ireland at the turn of the 20th century when it was still part of the British Empire? Are you talking about Ireland in the 1800s? Or are you talking about the Republic of Ireland? Or are you talking about the Isle of Ireland? Mm. Like the island, like as a whole. Um, yeah, and I think like the Irish language sometimes comes into play with that as well because I know Americans might be familiar with some Irish words like falche um, because anytime I ever go to an Irish bar I always see the word falche which means welcome 
and Blanche, which means cheers. These are the two that you would most like identify. If you ever went to an Irish bar anywhere in the world, regardless of where you are, you will probably see Falsha and Blanche. Mm-hmm. Um, there's a bar. There's a bar here with that name. Is there? Yes. <laughs> uh, that doesn't surprise me. That doesn't surprise me. I was I was actually in Boston um, two years ago. Um, I don't know. I've lost track of time. Um, and I went to an Irish bar and it was such a surreal experience because, I mean, there was nothing really going on. It was just like people aren't having drinks. And it was just like, oh, it's an Irish bar. And I saw like, I was seeing like these little Irish words kind of like all over the place. But I do think in America sometimes, not just America, but like other parts of the world as well, um, there's this perception that the Irish language is banned mm. or that no one speaks Irish. And I sort of wonder if, and I do sometimes wonder this even like about sections of Ireland where people think, oh, Irish literature, geek. like the writers, the romanticists, stuff like that. Um, and I'm like, no, Irish, the Irish language is very much alive. Um, and there are, there are Americans who learn Irish, there are people who speak Irish in North America. And I know there's some universities in North America that have Irish language programs. Yeah. Um, which is really cool for me. I think, I think that's absolutely fantastic. Um, and I would kind of I, would, I always wonder myself like what role would these institutions have in trying to reshape perceptions mm. of Ireland mm-hmm. like hopefully maybe using the language as a medium like introducing we're going to talk about Irish language or we're going to show you something that's done in the Irish language and hopefully this can like start a dialogue and a conversation about what you think happens in Ireland yeah. and what you think of Ireland and stuff like that. Because that's, we talked about language being a bridge. Yeah. And I think that's a fantastic way of looking into it because a lot of people don't think about Irish as a language. Right. And it's saying, okay, well, for example, like one of the TV shows I used to watch was called Shock, which means seven. And it was about music students in Belfast. I mean, it's showing my age here, probably about like 10, 15 years old, mm-hmm. um, if that um and it'd be really cool to sort of go like right so this is this tv show in irish in modern day belfast what can we take in a conversation about the role of the irish language in north Ireland today from the tv show as a starting point mm-hmm. and i think that would just be fantastic that would be fantastic that would definitely be a start and i think i think the one thing that the isle of ireland has on its side as far as stereotypes go is that um you do have such a rich culture of literature music dance poetry etc that i think to anybody with uh some worldliness about them could look at maybe the more negative things like the alcohol and the leprechauns and the saint patrick's day mm. and oh, the, leprechaun. <laughs> all that all that jazz mm. and they could say well there's this but then there's all of this there's yeah, all of this absolutely. richness and all of this um and it's a beautiful country too and i think mm. that i you know i i would hope that a lot of uh languages and a lot of countries and cultures have that uh, juxtaposition mm-hmm. to to balance out the the negative stuff, mm-hmm. but so, um, I think I I think Ireland um, on a whole the island I think that yeah, yeah. <laughs> I think that that's one good thing that that people can can say is like we have these traditions and they're very robust um, mm-hmm. and I hope that people can see that as well. John, this conversation is so much fun to have. Thank you so much. Yeah, I. And really enjoyed myself. Thank you for having me on your of show. Of course, of course. And um, you have to come back because we didn't even. I want to know how you're going to do with Hungarian, and you have to Ooh, come yeah. back and talk. You have to, you know, uh, with Yiddish and Hebrew. Just come back and anytime you want. Oh, yeah. Let's talk Thank about you. all these things. <laughs> so that'll be amazing. <laughs> the last question I have for you is. Do you have any jokes, popular sayings, tongue twisters, cool slang words, idioms, words of wisdom, or words of advice in Irish 
or anything typically heard in Northern Ireland to share? So in the spirit of Northern Ireland being, um, and the way we speak, being sort of a mixture of English, and Irish, and Bruno English, and a really interesting dialect, the most common thing you'll hear is you'll be grand. So anything, you're about to go bungee jump, you're about to take an exam, <laughs> you're, you're about to do anything, you can say, oh, it'll be grand. It'll, it'll be, be grand. grand. It'll be grand. It, you just say that off the ground. Anything, anything at all, it's off the ground. And um, what is the most famous word in Northern Ireland? Crack. C R A I C. Whenever I moved to England, I had to emphasize I'm not talking about drums. <laughs> I, am, I am talking about an Irish word. Um, so, crack is, you know, say, what's the crack? Or, which means, what's up? How's it going? Um, any crack with you, which means the same thing. You can also say, oh, that good crack, or and that bad crack just means it wasn't really fun or it was fun. Yeah. Um, yeah, it's an all, all encompassing word for pretty much everything. But if you're ever in Northern Ireland, you're going to hear crack and the grand. It'll be grand. <laughs> the grand. The grand. I love that. Yeah. This conversation was good crack. Yes, it was. It was great crack. <laughs> Thank you so much again. And oh, before before I say farewell, mm. um, don't think about it, but I'm going to open this up to like any language because you speak so many. Oh. In this situation that we've been talking for all this time, what would be the best way to say goodbye? Don't think about it too hard. First thing that comes to your brain. I really enjoy how you say goodbye in Hebrew. Okay. Le hitao. Le. Le. Eat. Eat. Tarot. 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 Yeah. Okay. So it means to see you again, to see you again. So it's like, I'll see you. Um, but I remember whenever I finished my course, my Hebrew teacher said, I'm not saying shalom, goodbye. I'm saying le because I'm going to see you again. And that's kind of, it's a weird thing. It always kind of stayed with me. I always thought it was kind of really sweet. Um, but in Irish, you could also say, Solana Walia. Um, Solana Walia? Salon. Salon. Awalia. Awalia. Yeah. Okay. That means like goodbye home. It literally means, I think, like goodbye home or bye home, but it, it means. Stay at home. Oh, yeah, I like that. Home. So if so if you're in the Republic of Ireland and you're ever leaving anywhere, you'll have the goodbye and you'll have Salon Awalia in the sign below in Irish, um, which I think is nice. I think. Yeah, love it. Yeah. Thank you again. Thank you again. No, thank you very much. <laughs> I will be talking to you soon. Yay. Bye. Bye.